And welcome back to Your American Story. This is your host, Raja. And joining me right now is Michael Lang, founder and CEO of NanoVision Diagnostics. Michael has 30 years of technical and executive experience in the medical devices industry. He has degrees in biomedical engineering and an MBA and holds five patents. He has extensive medical device industry background, including product development, marketing, strategic business development, technology assessment, and general management roles. He has played key roles in commercializing several disruptive technologies, including catheter-based cardiac procedures, minimally invasive laparoscopic t therapies, and novel biomaterials. He founded NanoVision Diagnostics in 2013. Michael will be pitching to our three investors, and uh, our investors are Jim Jordan, Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse, Mike Stubler, Managing Director and Co-Founder of Draper Triangle Ventures, and Ned Renzi, Founding Partner of Birchmere Ventures and Birchmere Labs. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the format. Michael will start with a four-minute pitch to our three investors. We have already decided the order in which our investors will ask questions. Each investor gets three minutes to use as they choose, either to provide feedback or ask questions. The responses from the entrepreneur will be included in this three-minute segment. After the investor segments, Michael will have one minute to make a closing statement. Daryl Grandy, our radio producer, will hold out a flag a minute out and uh, hold out the red flag when time's up. Uh, Michael, investors, welcome. Uh, Michael, you have four minutes uh, to make your opening pitch. Please proceed. Thank you, Raju. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, yes, as we noted, we founded Nanovision Diagnostics last year. As you noted, I'm a med device industry veteran. This is my latest startup. I've been in and around startups for many years. Uh, what Nanovision is doing is commercializing a novel cancer detection technology. Our core technology is a novel optical instrument that has a thousand times the resolution of a standard optical microscope. That allows us to make measurements of DNA structure, how the DNA packs and condenses to form the chromosomes. No one else has ever been able to make these measurements before, and no one else has been able to uh, um, to utilize this technology. We've, done, uh, we've conducted a number of clinical studies that show this correlates very well to cancer. Obviously, the molecular changes that cause cancer, the DNA changes that cause cancer, um, they also change the packing structure of the chromosome, and that's what we can measure. The, core, the key is we're measuring cancer at the very beginning of the process, at the molecular stage, well before it manifests. Um, there's two unique capabilities that we have with this technology. First, we can detect cancer er earlier and more accurately than conventional methodologies. We've conducted numerous studies, numerous clinical studies to demonstrate this. Uh, for example, just as one example, in breast cancer, uh, we showed that we can reduce the number of false positives by over half. Every one of these false positive cases goes on to surgery, so we just reduce by half the number of unnecessary surgeries. Obviously, huge uh, impact on the patient as well as cost as well. The second application that we have is maybe even more important. Not only can we detect cancer, we can ca detect cancer in the future. Our technology can assess which precancerous lesions will or will not progress to cancer. And that's very important because if, if, you, know the, if you know a precancerous lesion is likely to progress, then physicians can intervene and prevent that progression. Conversely, if you know it's not likely to progress, then you leave it alone and, and don't overtreat. Um, so again, huge clinical utility, huge clinical impact there. Really, in this application, we're, we're better than curing cancer, we're preventing it. Um, now, as I said, this technology is fully developed. Um, our system is operational. We've run 11 clinical studies in total, over 1,000 patients. And what's interesting, it works on seven different organ systems that we've tested in so far. So it seems to be um, a fundamental technology that's broadly applicable across every cancer that we've tested in so far. One other important note is that we do all this with a, with a standard biopsy slide. We don't need any kind of unique tissue prep. There's no chemistry involved. The same biopsy slide that the pathologist is currently using is the only input that we need. 
Um, so obviously this is a breakthrough technology. It's going to change the way cancer is, is uh, diagnosed and cured. But, it, it, but it's also a very attractive business opportunity. As I said, fully developed technology. The, clinic, the, the technical risks are very modest. The market applications are very broad. Um, again, we're, we're looking at uh, multiple different cancers that we're applicable to. We have strong IP in, uh, you know, uh, available so that it'll, it'll prevent uh, competition. Um, our initial focus is breast cancer. That alone is a half billion dollar market opportunity. Uh, we think all of our markets in aggregate are over a three billion dollar market opportunity. We've raised Series A investment capital, obviously looking to, to, to raise additional capital going forward. Uh, and we're hopeful to exit in the next several years by sale to a strategic partner, obviously uh, someone in the med device or, or diagnostics industry. So that's kind of a quick overview and happy to entertain questions. Oh, thank you, Michael. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you just uh, heard from Michael Lang, founder and CEO of NanoVision Diagnostics. And Michael just pits to our investors in the Running with the Bulls contest that uh, is uh, in collaboration with Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse. At this point, I'll turn this over to Jim Jordan from Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse. Thank you. I'd first like to uh, make mention that Michael was imported by the Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse from Texas <laughs> wow, that's great. as an You're executive welcome. in residence in the uh, PLSG program. It's put 32 executives out back into the field in Pittsburgh, and I think this is an example of this. The other thing I think that's wonderful about this technology is it's been vetted by the University of Pittsburgh and had a very significant investment from the Kotler Foundation. And so one of the things that we're all looking for investors is an independent third party vetted this technology who's quite frankly smarter than us. And so in this case, um, I, I'd like to start there because I, I, I think that's important. Can you share sort of the process um, that you went through to get the technology out of the university? Sure. Th thanks, Jim. That's a perfect intro. Um, as you noted, I, I've been collaborating with uh, the PLSG for, for going on f almost five years now. Um, and, uh, and through, through working with PLSG, I spent a lot of time working with Pitt and really was in a, in a wonderful position there to look at a plethora of different technologies, um, looked at over 100, did a deep dive on over a dozen of them, and this is the one that I chose to spin out. And as you noted, Jim, uh, this technology was received over $2 million in NIH grant funding while it was in the university. In addition, I've collaborated very closely with the technology developer, Dr. Young Liu. She's a biomedical engineer at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, we've raised over uh, over another million dollars in, in grant funding. So the, the NIH funding supported the uh, fundamental technology development. We have over a million dollars in grant funding that supported the clinical trials that I've referenced. That's what paid for the 11 clinical studies that we've conducted to date. Um, and then subsequent to that, uh, last year we, we, the, the data was coming in very positive. Again, some of the data that I alluded to, uh, we made the decision to spin it out last year and uh, formed a company. And we've raised uh, Series A investment capital subsequently to that. So, Raj, if I can make a point on, on the, what he calls grants. Grants mm -hmm. is what we call mm -hmm. non-dilutive funding. Yeah. Okay. So if it takes $10 million to get someplace and mm -hmm. you get $3 million that you don't have to pay back, that not only de-risks it for us, but if if we get 10 million, we just made three, yeah. right? So that's that's important to know. Yeah, and that's a good point um, because, you know, I say we started the company last year. We've really been working it right. for five years exactly. um, through the, through all these grant uh, support so, that we've so received. So one last question. What's unique is in this industry, as people are looking to finer tune cancer, they're moving to molecular diagnostics, which usually things are more complex and more expensive. This technology isn't, isn't doing that? What's the unfair advantage that you have and, and, and how did you get there and how long can you protect it for? Well, we have a, we have, we're fundamentally different than molecular diagnostics. Molecular diagnostics come into play when cancer is detected. Okay, you have cancer. Which subtype? Which, is gonna, it, which drug is it going to best respond to? Is it aggressive? Is it a slow progressing? Those are the questions that molecular diagnostics can answer. Molecular diagnostics are fundamentally very specific to a cancer type and they're very expensive because they take extensive you know, wet chemistry involved. Um, we actually work much earlier in the process. We work before you know you have cancer with a very simple, inexpensive, optics-based technology. So our system, you know, takes some effort to build this device and this instrument, but once it's built, it's, it's just, it's, a, it's like a computer, we, or an optical-based computer. Um, we run the slide on it, takes a few minutes, um, and there's, there's very low operating costs. So we have a, a huge cost advantage, number one. Secondly, we're ubiquitously applied applicable seemingly across all cancers, at least every one that we've tested in. And thirdly, um, we operate in a space where there's very little app, where there's very little technology today. You know, most pathology work is still done the same way it was a hundred years ago. A very specialized doctor 
all the pathologists looking in a microscope, looking at the way cell, you know, the cell structure and nuclear structure, etc. And and that's how they do it today. We can be adjunctive to that. We can help these uh, the pathologists make better diagnosis much earlier in the process because we can see what's going on with the molecules and they can't. Thank you, yeah. Michael. Th thank you, uh, thank you, uh, and thank you, Jim. At this point, I will turn this over to Mike Stubler from uh, Draper Triangle Ventures. Michael, so you're a diagnostic service business, so Correct. Pe people send samples to your facility where mm -hmm. you perform the test and yeah. give the results on That's that. That's exactly right. So how do you get doctors to send the samples to you? What's the process for making that sale or getting that flow of, of business where doctors are sending samples to your, yeah. your lab. First off, thank you for raising this point. It's something I should have brought up in my intro. Um, as a diagnostic service industry, this is not FDA regulated. FDA does not regulate uh, provision of care and these diagnostic services. They're regulated under a different agency, but, uh, but not FDA. Um, there's several hundred, over, in fact, almost a thousand diagnostic companies in operation today. So they all have to do the same thing. They have to have a test that's unique and that they have to show it has strong clinical utility show that it works, show that it, 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 it informs, a, you know, informs a, you know, a, a diagnostic decision, helps a physician make a, a treatment decision or a, you know, a, uh, a diagnostic decision, and then they have to commercialize that. They have to make physicians aware of that and offer the service uh, to, to physicians. So we're either going to work with um, established companies that already have a channel to our, to our current customers, again, prioritizing breast cancer as our initial market. Um, there's many companies that are already calling on and selling to these. Uh, to either breast surgeons or breast oncologists. Conversely, these, these surgeons mostly work in academic medical centers like UPMC or Cleveland Clinic. Um, so we could put in place our own small sales force to you know, promote this, uh, this novel technology, make them aware of it, and have them prescribe it such that they utilize it when, uh, when they feel they need additional information to make a, uh, a diagnostic decision. So, Michael, you mentioned that you'd hit, you had done 11 clinical trials to mm -hmm. date uh, to yeah. you know, prove efficacy in different sure. types of tissue. How many more trials do you have to do to get, to get enough uh, uh, traction and, 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 and attention in the medical mm -hmm. community for what you're doing? Well, many of these have been published, so they're all in major medical journals. We've gotten a lot of interest from the medical community, very significant interest. We, all of our trials are... are are modest in scope, you know, 100 patients or less. We've done, you know, our biggest one's a little over 100 patients. Um, so we want to run one or two, when it, once we're finalizing our, our, you know, our go-to-market strategy, and then run one, maybe two more larger studies in the, you know, three to 500 patient range. We're already at statistical significance, but a larger study would help cement the, um, um, the physician acceptance of this. So, and, and that's what, you know, we're, those are in process now and, and should be done uh, before the end of the year. So we'll be poised to go to market soon thereafter. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, all right, uh, thank you, Mike. At this point, I'll turn this over to Ned Renzi from uh, Birchmere Ventures and Birchmere Labs. Hey, Mike, thanks. I want to follow up, I guess, my, my first question kind of has two parts to it. And as an investor, one of the, and, and in some cases, a, personally a patient, one of the things I find frustrating about the whole medical establishment is everybody's interests are not aligned. Sometimes right. what's good for the doctor is not good for the patient, or what's good for the patient and the insurance company mm -hmm. reduces revenue to the doctor. And, and, and you like to think everybody's interests are aligned, but they're not. So maybe talk about this product in that context, and then also add on, you know, maybe address reimbursement. Is there a reimbursement code? Would you file under a miscellaneous code and what that would do to DSOs and stuff? Yeah, g very good points. Thank you for asking. Um, one of the things I liked about this technology when I looked at it is I did feel that, that all of the different stakeholders in the system can be advantaged. Again, this is not a primary diagnostic. We're not trying to compete with what a pathologist does today, many times they can make a definitive diagnosis. Yes, it's cancer. No, it's not. But lots of times they can. There's precancerous lesions. There's indeterminate cases. Or there's, um, there's just situations where they, they can't make a clean call. And that's where we can offer them a service as an adjunctive diagnostic. So we're not competing with pathologists. In fact, they'll get paid a, a, a separate fee for analyzing the results of our report. Uh, so they're advantaged. Obviously, the patient's advantaged. And then th because 
because of the nature of this technology, like I said, reducing unnecessary surgeries, making sure that only the patients who are going to progress are getting treated, it has huge cost implications, so obviously that's very important for the payer. So we think in this case that all the stakeholders' interests are aligned to use our technology, um, so we think that's very important. The second question you ask is, is critical. How do you get reimbursed for this? How, you know, how, does, how does this get paid for? And that's always the, uh, the $64 question in, uh, in health care. Um, we're, we have a couple of different options that we're finalizing a, a selection between. There is an existing code that, is, uh, that, that likely will be applicable. We're finalizing that, uh, that analysis today. Um, so we can utilize that code. It pays in the hundreds of dollars. Conversely, uh, as you noted, the, the, diagnost the uh, molecular diagnostics are broadly utilized. Many of them sell for in the, the, each test in the thousands of dollars. And we look at some of the tests that are, they're not necessarily competitive, but they're analogous. And they're upwards of three and four thousand dollars. Now, to do that, we'd have to get a unique code. So we're we're fine tuning that uh, business decision. We're better off to pursue a unique code, take us a little more time and effort and money, but have much higher uh, reimbursement rate rather than utilizing the existing code. It's still lucrative, still provides uh, very high margins, but not as high. So that's a, a decision that is that is imminent and will be finalized soon. I guess one last question is related to who you're actually selling to. One of the things we found in cancer related mm -hmm. is you have a, a primary care physician, mm -hmm. you have sometimes a surgeon involved, yeah. you have to train nursing staff, you have an oncologist who, who mm -hmm. so who all are you selling this product well, to? Well, you know, in, again, in breast cancer, these patients are being treated at high risk clinics. So they're, they're beyond the, the primary care physician. So they're at UPMC or whatever, um, being treated by typically one of the, one of our collaborators, we've been working with the surgeon there. Um, so usually it's a breast, there, there's a trioc of, of, of physicians who are involved in the patient, a surgeon, an oncologist, and a pathologist. So typically it'll be, the, it'll be one of those three that'll, that'll be ordering the test. Now again, they don't have to do anything, they just have to know the test exists, order the test, um, and then the hospital will send us a slide which, which we analyze. It's non-destructive, so we return the slide. So it really doesn't require any, any unique activities on behalf of the hospital. Just the physician has to know the test exists, believe in the value of it and order it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ned. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Running with the Bulls contest on Your American Story. I have been uh, in the startup space and investment space for a long time, and I got to tell you, the, the investors' questions are fascinating, and I learned a lot today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so at this point, Michael, I'm going to turn this over to you for a one-minute close. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate all the great questions. Um, you, you know, Jim, I'll come back to the first question you asked, how this gets started. It came out of the University of Pittsburgh here. It's a local spin-out. And like I said, I had the opportunity to look at hundreds of different technologies and analyze all of them in immense detail over a long period of time. Why did I pick this one? Because like any investor, I'm concerned about risk and return. And as I looked at this, the return was phenomenal. Uh, the margins are high, broadly applicable. It's it's a real game changer in technology. It's, it's going to change the way in which cancer is diagnosed and treated. So the, I think the returns on this are going to be very, very significant, you know, obviously, if we, if we properly exploit it and, uh, and execute the business model. Conversely, the risks for something of this magnitude, the risks are fairly modest. Again, because the technology is fully developed, it works. We've demonstrated in so many different clinical studies, the regulatory pathway is very simple. It, it goes through under the CLIA regulations as opposed to FDA a much simpler and shorter regulatory process. So um, the, the risk return uh, ratio on this was demonstrably better than any of the other technologies I, I reviewed. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, investors. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've heard uh, uh, Michael uh, pitch to our investors today. And uh, our investors and entrepreneurs, they uh, make an impact in terms of jobs, economy, and then sometimes uh, on the business uh, it's it's uh, life enhancing, uh, but you too can make an impact. And if you liked what Michael Lang had to say, you can go to the website. It's youramericanstory.com, and you can cast your vote for Michael Lang. Voting starts at uh, 4 p.m. today. So if you liked what Michael had to say, you can go uh, cast your vote, and the winner of the audience award uh, also gets $2,500 cash. Um, at this point, Michael, thank you, and investors, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to a commercial break. And this is your host, Raja, and I'll be right back.